Hi, right, Misha here. And we're kind of looking at some unique aircraft of Germany in World War II. In the first part, we looked at the Messerschmitt ME-163. And we will look at the Henkel HE-162 in part three. But this episode is probably on one of the most famous German aircraft of all time, the Messerschmitt ME-262. Uh, the fighter version was known as the Swallow, and the uh, kind of bomber ground attack version was known as the uh, Stormbird. And it was with the uh, ME-163 earlier. This is another, come on, 172 scale die cast from Oxford. Actually, a pretty good little value company for what these cost. Got a lot of metal. The engines are plastic, as are the uh, tail fins. I think the top is yeah metal. These are plastic. Has a canopy, but it doesn't open. And Oxford doesn't um, do landing gear options. You just get it kind of, you know, in flight. And uh, they're prop planes. The props don't spin. But for a jet, that doesn't really matter. So with that out of the way, I'm not even going to try to go into all the history of this plane because it's so famous and influential. I'll just kind of give a little character. Around 1936, the very first successful jet engines were invented. And it wasn't long before the German military took notice. However, 1938-1939 funding was pretty darn low and it was a low priority. At that time they thought the um, the war would be won quite easily and prop aircraft would be enough. So the idea was basically this was for the next war. But you know they were going to work on it. And uh, the really the first successful prototype, it was never meant to be a production, was the HE-178 from Henkel. It flew in 1939 and was basically a proof of concept. Work on the what would become the ME-262 happened at Messerschmitt, and even Wilhelm Messerschmitt himself wasn't just super into this. So, you know, early on, it just wasn't getting a lot of priority. But as the war intensified, and it was pretty clear that it wasn't just going to end immediately, this started to get a higher priority. The airframe originally flew in April of 1941. And it had props, just traditional piston engines. So it was just kind of a test of the concept. At that time, they were having a lot of trouble with the jet engines, getting them right, mostly to do with the metal. Uh, these jets were operating at much higher temperatures than they were used to, and they just couldn't really get the metal to, to put up with the abuse. So it really delayed the program. But then finally, they were able to fly this and test with jet engines. And move it over to production. The first ME-262 squadrons 
were established and training was set up in April of 1944. And throughout that summer, June, July, August, these were delivered to the Luftwaffe in uh, small numbers. A few dozen here, a few dozen there. The first confirmed combat kills happened in July of 1944, so these were in service, if limited. And they would be increasingly used throughout the year. And production, after kind of a halting start, would start to really ramp up. It's a respectably large airplane. We're about 42 feet by 32 feet, predominantly made of metal, plenty of alloys. We have two wing mounted engines. The wings themselves have a slight curvature, a slight sweep to them. This could be fitted with either two or four. 30 millimeter, excuse me, yeah, 30 millimeter uh, cannon. You could also be equipped with rockets or two bombs when in the attack roll. It was a very fast plane for World War II, almost hitting 550 miles per hour and had a ceiling of over 37,000 feet. And it carried enough aviation fuel for 60 to 90 minutes of powered flight. So, while not extreme, better than the 163, huh? That which had seven and a half minutes of powered flight. On the other hand, this used twice as much fuel as a traditional two engine piston plane. So, the speed and everything came at a cost. These went up against bombers over Europe, of course, as well as the P-51 Mustang. And while, like any new technology, they had their shortcomings, of course, it actually proved itself quite well. In fact, testing after the war showed that this was superior to the British Gloucester Meteor in several ways, and even the American P-80. In other ways, the American and British planes were better, but uh, this definitely wasn't a slouch. And it was very forward-thinking in a lot of ways. It's said that the ME-262 was delayed into going into production and combat because of Hitler. He intervened in 43, stating his preference for the Stormbird uh, attack variant. This is possible, but this plane was experiencing plenty of delays on its own, thanks to the engine technology and other things. So. Probably Hitler's actual impact on the 262 project was less than he would have liked to imagined. He was one of those people that as important as he was in Nazi Germany, I think he thought himself more, I think a lot of times people just told him yes, walked away and they did their own thing. <laughs> Regardless, by January of 1945, the first pure jet fighter wing, JG-7, was established, and then JG-44 was established in February of that year. And this led to the first large-scale engagements with many uh, ME-262s in March of that year. And by many, I mean, you know, 20, 30, 40, which was a large number at that time. Of course, these would go up against bombers, 
and have to contend with the Mustang and other craft. Then in April of 45, this was employed more in the ground attack, you know, uh, support role, mostly on the Eastern Front to assist uh, retreating German units. And these were used to strafe Russian columns, troops, and uh, vehicles. And while the 163 was pretty much out of service by this point, the 262 would remain very much active up until the very, very end of the war. And by that I mean like the afternoon of the surrender, uh, May 8th. One of these met a kill against a Russian aircraft that's said to be a uh, P-39. But yeah, it's, it's quite likely that a... Uh, 262 made the final kill in the air, air-to-air -air kill combat of World War II, if not one of the very, very, very last. While the plane itself was reasonably successful, they produced over 1,400 of them. Pretty impressive, considering how late it came. And they even had a pretty successful night version reconnaissance version and it actually had very good performance for the first jet in the end like any one-off super weapon it just wasn't enough to stem the whole tide and of course these did not take to the skies until after D-Day which of course had a major impact the, uh, the Luftwaffe really wasn't present in Europe the summer of 44 so the Allies were able to firmly gain control of the skies nevertheless I'm sure this delayed the the surrender by a little bit, and uh, people lost their lives because of the 262. Interestingly, while Germany, of course, quit using these at the end of the war, many 262s remained in service in Czechoslovakia. In fact, even some were assembled in Czechoslovakia in 1946, and this was kept in Czech military service until around 1951, at which time it was replaced by uh, Soviet MiG 15s. And of course, this had a major influence on all later jets like the F 84, MiG 9, which led to the MiG 15, so on and so forth. So, uh, historically, a very important plane and a very interesting story, nonetheless. Well, folks, that's pretty much a little synopsis. Obviously, there's tons of documentaries and articles out there, so I'd recommend a Google search to learn more if you don't happen to know about the ME-262 Swallow. Very interesting aircraft. Any questions or comments, welcome on below. If you could, like, share, and subscribe, and tune in again next time for more random videos of whatever I feel like making. Plus, we'll take care of part three with the People's Fighter, so tune in again soon for that one. This is Misha, and I'll catch you next time.